they both will speak for around 10 minutes. Uh, and afterwards, we have Bernadette Moore from the computation, who is also a PhD student from the computational soft matter group, uh, who will talk about rational optimization of drug membrane selectivity by computational screening. Um, I would kindly ask you to leave any questions uh, till after all three presentations, um, because otherwise it might be a bit too long. Um, so first off, we will start with Maarten. Uh, followed by Casper and uh, Bernadette. So, uh, Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Eric, for that nice introduction. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, um, I'd like to talk with you about a little bit about myself, so you know me a little bit more, and uh, talk about the framework that I am uh, developing uh, to do um, interactive dynamic social networks. So, um, as Eric already said, I am a, a PhD student for one year now. Last year, February, I started uh, at the uh, Center for Urban Mental Health. So this is quite a big uh, center. It's been, uh, it's quite new as well. And it tries to get people from many different disciplines with many different expertises together and to make use of uh, everyone's knowledge to uh, unravel a little bit of the mystery uh, that are these uh, urban mental health conditions. Um, we all know that uh, urbanicity has increased. And with this, we also notice that the mental health uh, issues have really been rising um, for the past, uh, uh, for these times. So, um, so yeah, I come in from a bit more technical side. I did uh, theoretical physics and computational science. And now I am a psychologist. Um, I am uh, working on, let's say, let's call it computational modeling of psychological and social dynamics of urban mental health conditions. And um, at least in the beginning, I will be mainly focusing on uh, the case of addiction. And I think it's a really good example of a thing that's normally being looked at as a psychological thing, but it's actually very much influenced by uh, your social network. So your in, first of all, your initial contact uh, with drugs, right? Like it almost always comes from, your first cigarette come from, comes from a friend. Um, and um, on the other way around as well, right? Like as your addiction continues, you can also see that um, you change your social network um, as well. For example, um, normal people have on average like 22 uh, good contacts that they have around them but you can see some isolations when uh, addiction continues. So um, addicts have way less, for example, only like around 14 close contacts. What you can also see is that you start to see some clustering of social network of uh, addicts together. So not only do you have less connections, you can also see that, for example, 40% become um, other addicts. And you can imagine that that is really uh, making it a lot harder for you to get uh, to recover if your whole world, including your social wor world, uh, is um, all about uh, addiction. Um, and so I think my uh, coming from a little bit of a different background, I think my first year I mainly actually caught up on psychology. Um, I did a literature review on all the computational models um, on addiction both from the psychological field and also from the social science field. And um, what you see is that these are really quite disjoint. Uh, psychology does really not take um, social interactions too much into account. At best, it's like a covariate, um, while social science uh, really looks at the spread of, uh, of it uh, as if it were like a contagious disease but not really taking the complexities of uh, this psychological thing uh, into account. So, um, so let's take a little bit of step back, right? So what do I mean with interactive dynamic social networks? Um, so with interactive, I would mean that if we have a social network right here, then um, we uh, have the ego whose inner state uh, impacts the uh, states of his alters, right? So you, you have impact on your friends 
But similarly, this impact then also makes the inner state of the alters different, which then feeds back into the ego. So you've got like an uh, interactive feedback loop here. And uh, what I'm also working on is this importance of uh, dynamic social networks. This is because um, what you already see with addiction is that, that your network really changes and this matters a lot. And it's not just the strength of the connection, but you break connections and you make new uh, connections with other addicts, for example. So um, it's hard to work with, I know, uh, but I think it's really important to, um, to keep this in mind as well. Now, it's also, I think it can be used, this kind of method, for quite a lot of uh, different types of uh, problems. So not only addiction or depression, but also polarization of opinions. You can really model quite nicely with this. Um, and because it, because it is so, um, maybe it gives so many opportunities, I think, and because we didn't really find any good um, frameworks to, to do this kind of modeling uh, in, and I want to model, of course, and spend as less time as possible uh, on the programming parts. Um, we've decided to create our own package to do most of this work for us. So the package is named uh, Dynamic Network Simulation Framework, DynSimp. It's been mainly created by, the, by my excellent master student, Matthijs Meyer, who maybe is here as well. I'll put the links in the, in the chat afterwards. Um, and so the next part of this presentation, I'd like to talk a little bit about what this package does and hopefully maybe uh, uh, you can find that this could be useful for you as well. Um, so the biggest advantage what this does that really no, nothing else does is that it's, um, it can make dynamic networks using the very simple utility cost um, function uh, idea, right? So you have friendships that have that you maintain have a certain benefit. They have a certain utility that comes with it and advantages you get, but also you have a limited resource um, to maintain friendships, right? That could either be, either be time that you can spend um, or it could be for, be, for example, emotional energy. So there's also a certain cost related. And then with this framework, um, it's quite easy to make your network dynamic and the framework does everything around it um, by using this utility cost uh, method. Now, um, yeah, so we also uh, made it quite fast using arrays, which is a new, uh, using NumPy array, arrays, we're doing the, the calculations, which is also quite uh, new. And on the right, you can see a nice example, right, of a constantly changing dynamic network, social network of like a toy model that we made of uh, addiction. Um, lastly, I'd like to show you uh, our favorite that we all love, the basic store model, just to show you a little bit how easy it can be and um, how we use this framework to, uh, yeah, to implement a, a store model. So we start off with um, creating, using network X to create the, the first graph. Then of course we want to uh, define our uh, constants. Then we are defining our in initial states. So our initial situation that we have. So here we do a couple of people uh, start of being affected and the rest is uh, susceptible. And then of course, the important one is uh, to update these states over time. And you can see here that we look at uh, your social connections neighbors. So we look at the, the, the neighbors that you have, the, your uh, closest social contacts and then you have a certain chance to infect those people. And then lastly, there's also, of course, your, um, your random chance to be recovered over time. And then in the bottom here, we define the, mo the model. And then this uh, would bring us already quite a nice looking um, time lapse of how uh, a disease would spread over a social network, as we can see here. And I think this is already a lot better than um, than uh, a population-based uh, SIR model, for example. And on the left, we have our classic uh, result of the SIR uh, uh, graphs. Yeah, so this was uh, the short talk and all the time I had. Um, I'd love to meet you all uh, in person and drink a beer. Uh, and I hope it will uh, be soon. And I also hope I maybe inspired you or maybe made you think of 
possibilities that you could use this kind of modeling for as well. I'd really like to hear uh, what this could be used for as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Maarten. I've taken a look at the code myself and it looks very nice. So I might use it for my own uh, research later on. Um, next up is, is, is Kasper, if you can uh, share your screen. And we leave the questions for Maarten to the end. I'm sorry, but it's, uh, yeah, I think the most efficient. Yeah. Okay, you're up, Kasper. Uh, yeah, so thanks. Um, yeah, I'm a first year PhD student at the CSL group. Uh, I work together with Vic, Vic Wax and Peter Sloat. And uh, my project is on uh, uh, disrupting criminal networks. And we work together with uh, the Dutch National Police and the um, uh, Regional Inlichting and Expertise Centrum, the RIEC. <laughs> no real translation for this, but yeah. So what's exactly the problem? Well, if you look at society, you can have this divide between normal, regular law-abiding citizens and uh, the criminal underground, as I call it. And if you imagine a street like this, where you have different various shops or shopping centers, what um, they call is criminal undermining activity is when these shops or venues are used for criminal ends to either cause money laundering or human trafficking or illegal drug synthesis, uh, which forms a danger to uh, normal society. And that's what needs to be stopped. Um, yeah, so conceptually speaking, what you can do is you can visualize society as a graph where I indicate every dot here as a person. So imagine where you have a nice law abiding citizen as Rick has indicated here. But you may also interact maybe unknowingly with criminals and they can operate in various different markets like uh, weapon trade or illegal drug trade or uh, money laundering schemes. So you can visualize as this. So each color here is uh, uh, so the gray, the gray parts, by the way, are the edges between people, so just connections. And uh, I may be a part of a criminal network. And in our project, what we focus on specifically is the undermining criminal markets in the drug trade, uh, and, and even more specifically on cocaine. Um, and what, what the Dutch National Police and the RIC is mainly interested in is finding out what happens when uh, a, a criminal network adapts to an either external or internal intervention. And an external intervention would be something like a police intervention, where they uh, either um, detain somebody or arrest somebody for a long period of time, or maybe put somebody in prison. An internal could be something like a murder or a breach of trust between people. Um, and next to that, they also want to sort of know how to effectively disrupt these criminal networks. And most of their approaches now has been done only structurally, uh, which I'll show a bit about later. And so you can sort of decompose a, a complex adaptive system in terms of the dynamics the network has and the dynamics that exerts on the system. Uh, so they, those will be our two main uh, yeah, focuses on the in, in, in the study. Um, so what do I exactly mean? Well, this is the same graph as before. And then uh, you have this, we need the structure. So who talks to who? And additionally, we need to know what this, the, the people in the network are doing. So you, I animated this simple um, yeah, conceptual uh, model. There's no real like hardcore uh, coding behind this, um, where this network is changing over time. And in order for us to create an insight as to who exactly is in this network and what the network is doing, we are using three data sources. One is uh, the PGP data set. So that was recently also in the, in the Dutch news, at least where they, Dutch National Police cracked this um, encrypted uh, sky, sky messaging service. And the idea is that we take these uh, unencrypted um, uh, messages between criminals to sort of deduce rules on what criminals are doing in these criminal networks. Uh, additionally, we also have a bunch of informant data. Uh, this is where, of course, the partners come in. They would provide us uh, context to the PGP data on what's going on. And lastly, we have uh, criminal records, which are just like normal um, judicial things on what happened in, uh, with the people involved in the networks. And we want to combine these to eventually get to something where we have a spatial temporal model, um, or at least it, we could lead to a spatial temporal model that could uh, be uh, predicted for the cocaine um, market in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, so what type of methods are we using? You can sort of make a divide in two. We have, on the one hand, computational modeling, um, which can range from very mechanistic approaches to like ABMs to more uh, statistical physics approaches. 
And on the other hand, we have analysis methods that uh, sort of, if we have these models available, how do we actually come to understand what the models are doing? Um, so you could think of, uh, for instance, trying to understand how a tipping point occurs in, in, uh, in switching behavior. So imagine if a criminal market changes its behavior rapidly by either a uh, new law being available and or um, um, new technology being available. The police wants to sort of be able to adapt to these changes rapidly and possibly also stop them before they happen. Um, in terms of the team, so we have quite a broad spectrum, I think. So on the one hand, we have uh, two people that are highly involved that, uh, that form a crucial bridge to the domain and application side, uh, Thais, Fis, and uh, Paul Dan. And we have a new PhD starting uh, pretty soon, which is supposed to form this bridge between me and the, the domain experts. And then we have me and Rick focusing on the computational modeling and uh, the analysis methods. So the sort of the vision looks like this. Um, yeah, okay. So um, in order for me to get sort of an insight of what do I exactly mean with this? So one of the things that the police is using are social network analysis to identify crucial points in the network. And those are called uh, centrality metrics from network science. So usually what that means is that uh, centrality measure is basically a, a function that maps an importance vector to each node in the network based on the connectivity of that network, of, of the node in the network. So if you have this classic Krakart kite graph here, um, the between the centrality is, is a measure of how, how many times a node acts as the shortest path, so a bridge between any two nodes in the network. And if you do that for every node in the network, you can uh, assign a important score, which I here indicated with the size of these um, circles. And you have a bunch of them. So it's also non-trivial to pick one that would actually lead to the most important node. And it depends on what type of importance you attribute to the node in terms of the topology. And we looked at this and we were like, well, that's kind of weird because if you have a real world network, it both has a structure as well as a dynamic on the network. So we use the toy um, dynamic on uh, random and a real world network to generate uh, temporal dynamics. And then we use the information theory to then infer what would be the most important node according to the information theory metric, which is uh, not this one. And we then we validated this with uh, actual causal interventions. So with causal interventions, you can get sort of a ground truth of what is important in the network. You intervene on a node and you see what the changes are in the dynamics. And we did that with two different ones, soft and hard interventions, where soft interventions are small, tiny nudges of a node dynamics over time. And then we see that this sort of gray node here on the perimeter is very important according to this soft intervention. And if we then look at this information metric, it nicely uh, matches this, uh, this periphery node. Whereas if you do a hard intervention, it identifies a different uh, node to be important. So this, this result is already highly complex and to sort of translate this to the real world, what you see here, first of all, is that structure doesn't necessarily indicate nodal importance. And additionally, the size of the intervention actually matters in terms of what type of dynamic you see and what node becomes more important. And these soft interventions are um, sort of more indicative of what, they, uh, what we call sort of natural dynamics in the network. So this information theory metric is based on observations alone. So you would, the police would only have information about criminal behavior, doesn't necessarily always uh, intervene with them. And what you want is to have a small enough intervention to have maximal effect. And that's actually what our metric nicely shows. Um, yeah, and in terms of like challenges we have for the coming year, um, one big problem is that in criminal literature, uh, computational modeling is pretty much non and void. So we really need to sort of bring these ideas from complexity science into this new field um, to sort of teach us, you know, um, what is possible with this type of uh, modeling, what we can do. Uh, and additionally, as I already highlighted earlier, like we're focused on one market now, but a, a, a criminal is not necessarily involved in only one market. And this interaction is, is also highly non-trivial. Um, so in the, as, a, as a dot on the horizon, we kind of want to look at those things. Um, so this was a sort of very short bird's eye view of what we're doing and what we've done so far. So I would like to yield the floor now. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Casper. Uh, and you might have uh, another data source soon because they hacked another uh, crypto phone uh, provider, I guess, uh, a couple of months ago. Okay. And lastly, if you can unshare your screen. Uh, yeah. I think you 
you are able to share your screen already, uh, Bernadette, because you're a co-host now. You're muted still. Ah, yeah. But you're still uh, muted. We can't hear you. Yeah. Yeah, that's better. I but apparently can't unmute myself while I'm already sharing my screen. Oh. It's uh, interesting to know. <laughs> ah, yeah. Yeah, so no, now, now you fine. should see my presentation. Yeah, but it's not the full screen yet. Not, oh, uh, it's. No, I'm it was sorry. in the screen, but not full screen. Yeah. Just so you know. Thanks for uh, letting me know. That's always something I struggle with. Uh, mm -hmm. And I have a talk uh, at APS on Monday, so it's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Now you're good to go, I guess. OK. So. Now, I work on rational optimization of drug membrane selectivity uh, by computational screening. And I'm working together uh, with uh, Kirill Schmilovich from uh, the University of Chicago. Um, who's part of the results, I will, of course, uh, present it as well. So a bit of a background. Um, what uh, materials development uh, wants to do or materials design is uh, design materials with uh, specific functions. Um, there, for that, um, we need to understand the underlying physical or chemical or however detailed you want it, uh, mechanisms. Um, therefore, we want to define structure property relationships. And um, that uh, means that uh, molecules with similar structures are believed to have similar properties, which kind of is a no brainer. So um, we need to define relevant factors for possible interactions and define the resulting difference between molecules. So basically, yes, get design rules um, for molecules that have uh, desired interactions and then screen for uh, candidate structures. On the right, you see uh, uh, this uh, schematic. It's plainly for uh, drug design, but it uh, also um, is true for any other kind of material design. And in the end, it is about finding structures that are chemically possible and have the um, desired properties. What I'm using for my work uh, is a membrane lipid, uh, cardiolipin, the top one. It exists in eukaryotic cells, so animals, humans, um, only in the mitochondria and they're only in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Uh, it has uh, with it a peculiar shape with the four uh, fatty acid tails um, and a relatively small head group. So this part is the uh, red circle in a membrane bilayer and those are the tails that are hydrophobic and um, create a mid plane of the bilayer. And uh, because it has four tails and a small head group, it has a cone shape and uh, makes it possible for the inner membrane to fold like this because it aggregates in the outer uh, fold uh, parts, basically. It uh, takes part in the fusion and fission, so parting and uh, aggregating of mitochondria and is linked to aging and the a number of diseases if anything is wrong with this cardiolipin. As a test, uh, I use uh, a second phospholipid, phosphatidylglycerol, which is, if you look at it chemically, half a cardiolipin. So it's a precursor and basically two PGs make one CL. So if I find molecules that have a significant preference to interact with cardiolipin compared to PG, I have found something that uh, hopefully will uh, transfer to uh, experimental results. 
there is one molecule that has been published to be uh, to have a slight preference to cardiolipin compared to PG. That's the known as acridin orange. Um, and in the background, you see an overlay where the beads that uh, I will get at, uh, later. Um, I'm using coarse grained representations for my simulations. So if you look at the uh, lipids again, they have two phosphate. Uh, CL has two phosphate groups. Um, PG1, so two negative charges, one negative charge, and they are able to undergo hydrogen bonding. And um, the NaO molecule has a positive charge here and uh, is uh, able to hydrogen bond with the aromatic ring structures here. So as first, from the first glance, we want to have a corresponding positive charge for each of the phosphate groups of the cardiolipin, and we have uh, want to have an uh, option to hydrogen bond um, to the head group. Also, um, the NAO has a um, hydrocarbon chain that's hydrophobic, so it is easier for it to insert into the membrane because this chain wants to get away from, uh, from uh, water or cytoplasm. I'm using uh, molecular dynamics. I'm going to give a very short uh, overview in case you're not familiar with that. It's a simulation me method where, uh, in my case, bi biological systems uh, molecules are um, represented uh, with uh, coordinates and interactions uh, for each atom in an, uh, or each bead, whatever you use. and um, you initialize uh, the coordinates and the velocities. You calculate uh, vectors for uh, acceleration, velocity, and the potential energy in this uh, state. You adjust the time. You create a trajectory by um, performing this again and again over time. And then uh, you update the coordinates and the velocities in, at the next time step and repeat this uh, from step two until a certain cutoff is reached. Mostly that's uh, a, fig a maximum number of time steps you want to do or a, a certain force or whatever you, um, you are looking at. Um, you evaluate uh, velocities and accelerations by um, evaluating Newton's equation of motion in the uh, very basic uh, form, or um, of course, there are more sophisticated formulations of the same thing. Yeah. As I hinted at, I'm using coarse grained representations where um, mostly four uh, or up to four um, atoms that are not hydrogen, so heavy atoms are grouped together into one bead, uh, and those beads represent the average of the chemical and physical properties of all the atoms that are inside it. Um, as you can see in this plot uh, where there's uh, the histogram of pop uh, populations of uh, small molecules in a database, in the atomistic representation or the coarse-grained representation, um, one coarse-grained uh, structure can cover uh, a number of atomistic structures. This uh, reduces the computational complexity a lot or the combinatorics uh, of the uh, effort. But also, if you look at the right side with the three molecules that are atomistically quite simple, but all have uh, uh, tiny uh, differences, coarse grains, they all map to the same beads. So those uh, small details of uh, chemistries get lost in the coarse grained um, approach, but it still um, it allows for uh, correct uh, representation of uh, physical uh, properties and chemical processes. Um, you can simulate longer time scales than you could with uh, atomistic um, representations. So it's or screen a big number of molecules a lot faster, which makes it still worthwhile uh, doing coarse grain simulations over atomistic simulations. So methods. 
There's one very widely used and published uh, force field uh, containing 21 beads. Uh, it's the Martini force field. A colleague of mine has, but has shown that um, you can cover chemical space efficiently and correctly with only five bead types or branched out slightly into seven. And to uh, make it even more efficient, we are really only using five uh, of his uh, bead types for, for our work. And he was so kind to add uh, charged beads because, as I said before, um, we think that charges are important to uh, find the relevant uh, chemistries um, for our target. So we are uh, we um, represent random arbitrary molecular structures as graphs. Those are uh, some examples from the initial uh, round where it's just an average about uh, over pos uh, possible uh, combinations of bead types and connectivity of uh, we are using um, uh, bead uh, graph sizes of uh, up to five beads, so up to five nodes in the graph. Yep. And uh, I'm calculating free energies. Uh, free energies represent the amount of energy that is av available in a system to do work. Um, a change of, uh, of the system state results in a change of the free energy. So negative free energy changes uh, mean that the process is uh, energetically favorable. That's important uh, because I'm going to show negative values. So the more negative my results, uh, my differences in free energy, I'm looking at the delta delta G in the end, um, the better, the more, the bigger the preference of uh, the candidate structure to cardiolipin is compared to PG. And uh, Kirill does the learning, the learning side of the, um, of the work. He uses the free energies I calculate uh, in my simulations. And then uh, he created a learning cycle uh, of uh, consisting of a regularized autoencoder, a GPR and an active learning step to traverse uh, and explore his uh, latent space and uh, predict from my um, free energies candidate structures for the next round that uh, could perform better in the simulation. And with those, I'm doing a next round of uh, MD simulations, uh, free energy calculations to confirm or uh, or not confirm his uh, predictions. And he uses the results again to train his, uh, his setup. If you want to know more uh, about what he does, um, he has a very nice paper published already. Yeah, fun stuff now. Um, we have performed seven rounds of this uh, free energy calculations and uh, learning cycles. And you can see the first one is the gray and uh, the last one is the blue um, curve in this kernel density estimate plot. Um, the change in free energies, uh, in free energy difference between PG and CL moves more to the uh, negative uh, range. So we have been uh, very much improving the uh, binding affinity to cardiolipin compared to PG in the um, first round, but now um, in uh, three, five, and seven, definitely it uh, looks like there's not going to be much more improvement uh, to be expected if we would continue the learning cycle uh, uh, onwards from here. And if you look at the speed uh, distribution in the rounds, round zero was just uh, evenly or more or less evenly uh, distributed any kinds of the beads we use. And um, 
pretty soon it uh, turned out that we found in our approach that we have apolar beef, so purple and blue, slightly polar green, not a lot of uh, very polar beets, which is blue and red, and hardly any negative charges, but a lot of uh, positive charges, which if you remember uh, what the target molecule uh, has uh, for uh, as chemical properties makes sense, because that has negative charges, which would, which would explain um, the positive, uh, positively charged beads and um, we want something that inserts in the membrane that would be the um, apolar and very hydrophobic beads and a bit of polarity that uh, most of the time um, goes hand in hand with hydrogen bonding. Yeah, those are the 16 uh, best of all of our um, of our iterations, um, the best molecule has been turning up, I think, since round three or four. Every time it, uh, the same structure was predicted, and so also that um, doesn't improve any uh, more. We, which makes us very confident that our uh, system is converged. And uh, you can see we always have two positive charges. We have apolar with the sli slightly polar beads and you can also see that there's in the structures uh, most of them seem to be smallish so that it's easy for them to insert into the dense uh, membrane and they have cycles which also corresponds with the initial NaO molecule that had three uh, aromatic benzene rings. To get back from the coarse grain structures, because as I said, um, one coarse grain representation can stand for a number of atomistic real existing molecules. I used uh, an algorithm that uh, can um, identify functional groups from um, atomistic representations from smile strings. And I used the same database uh, that was used to generate the reduced uh, coarse grained force field to um, find out what functional groups I could identify in there and to which bead types uh, they predominantly map. So here um, it uh, shows a map, uh, a heat map of the experimental probabilities of how often do I find for example, an amine in this database and to which bead does it predominantly map, they are column normalized. So in each column, the darkest uh, square is the bead type that uh, most likely will uh, represent the chemistry of a certain functional group. And I've applied this um, on a set of molecules, I've screened the uh, vendor database to find structures that already exist. Um, use this mapping table to coarse grain them. And then uh, Kirill uh, used uh, predicted free energy differences uh, using a lasso uh, regression method. And um, as you see in this plot, I plotted the uh, um, free energy differences between the insertion in a PG and CL mem membrane here. And the red line is uh, the predicted uh, free energy difference of the original NaO molecule, which I applied the same um, uh, coarse graining by mapping uh, approach to, and apparently the predicted, at least the predicted uh, free energy changes are at least as good or better than uh, the original published molecule. So it looks pretty much like uh, we would be onto something here. So we um, want to, as a further work, um, 
want to use those uh, optimized uh, structures or the results from our learning procedure to predict uh, the relevant chemical interactions for in the end any given target. This should not only work for the uh, lipid I'm using at the moment. Um, I very much want to refine the resolution of uh, my um, mapping tables I have, so I need more data to really predict what functional group, what chemical would map, uh, what, what chemistry would map to which uh, bead type or which group of bead beca beads, because in the end it could span more than one bead. And uh, very hopefully we will be able to correlate the simulation and prediction results uh, with experimental data. Yeah. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Bernadette, for this very nice uh, presentation. Also, thanks, Martin and Kasper, as well. So, I would like to to open the floor for questions for uh, any one of the three speakers. So you can ask. I saw a question in the chat, but it's already been answered. So, if you unshare your screen, uh, Bernadette, we can maybe see the rest. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So I would just say, if you want, you have a question, you can just uh, speak up. Um, I have a question. If uh... yeah, yeah, please go ahead. And uh, it's for Casper. Uh, uh, thanks for a nice presentation on a very interesting uh, topic. Um, I was just thinking in in crimes that the more important you are, the less you want to be in the network. So is that um, first of all, I is that a I see that as a quite peculiar problem to like this field and how is there a way to deal with that? Is there somehow you take that into account? Like in the modeling or in data collection or somehow? Yeah, so that that's uh, indeed a thing. Um, it's known as the security efficiency trade-off. Uh, and I think, I'm not sure if Kuhn is still here, but he's working with insurgency networks, um, which is yeah, it's a prime example of like, uh, if you look at the Al-Qaeda networks, I think like 40 years ago, people really thought that crime, criminal networks were like this mafia structure where there's one kingpin and like it sort of trickles down. And nowadays that's it's more diffuse and decentralized. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is a, a, one big problem they have in criminal science is that there's this thing called the dark figure, which means that they don't they only measure parts of these networks, right? They only either they catch people and then they can interrogate them. Um, or they have to get information through informants, or maybe they crack a PGP server, but then still it doesn't give the full picture. Um, so modeling it, uh, modeling these types of networks is quite challenging because first of all, you don't know what they're doing. And then if they're doing something, it's only part of the observations that you actually need. So in, in uh, like, if you can sort of say it in parts of it would say that you first need to do this huge taxonomy on like, what is exactly possible and why do people act on crimes? And then you bring in the computational scientist, and unfortunately, I'm already now on the front lines trying to make it work. Uh, but it, 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 these are things that are yeah, highly, highly non-trivial to work with and, and challenging to do. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Uh... No, I was just, I mean, perhaps it's just sort of yeah, a genuine yeah. problem. I was just wondering if there is, I don't know, you can integrate it like increase your the uncertainty in the network structure however it's like is there some way to to deal with it yeah i think in the in a, Danny Borsbaum and his group they with network inference from psycho symptoms they also have these uncertainty quantifications with how likely is it that an edge will actually be from symptom a to symptom b and they can generate these huge uh, different forms of the graphs that they get and then get an uncertainty quantification on whether there's actually an edge between these things um, in terms of um, like the network generation now, um, I'm not too familiar because it's like police strategies that is not technically shared with me. So I don't know exactly how they form the networks. Um, yeah, okay. I just get networks and then I have to trust on the fact that they are correct. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there you are sort of 
uh, you got me. So I'm part of Dennis group and that was kind of why I was interested to like, so we, we definitely deal with this problem as well. Um, when we look at symptoms, I was just wondering if we could learn something from how this criminal networks were established, but yeah, if, I'm, if so sure. I'm, I'm actually, uh, so we are currently in the process of actually getting data. It's been quite difficult to get data in general because I don't have a security clearance, for instance. So they have to anonymize the data. And uh, we had to get through, I think, the, the Minister of Defense or so to get actually access uh, to share it with us. But we're getting into the process now. So um, I'm actually uh, interested in learning about these techniques as well, because we need to, at some point, estimate from the raw data what is actually happening. Yeah. And I could happily do research for four years long on uh, you know, statistical physics and be fine with it. Mm -hmm. But at some point, we actually do have to go to the application domain and say, like, OK, well, if you give us the network, if you give us the dynamics, we can do all these analysis methods. But yeah. right now, you need to be sure, like, how do you infer that the thing you're actually measuring is correct and the dynamics that you have is actually correct? Yeah. Um, okay. And in particular for criminal science, it's, it's just very difficult because you're not a criminal. And even if you're a criminal, then you, you may not even be aware of like, yeah, what do I actually do when I deal in cocaine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or let's just improvise. Yeah, you don't exactly send like a, a, a questionnaire to the Satidura yeah. or Health Angels. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, I, I, what, so for instance, what they know from the adaptation so far is that for instance, if somebody gets killed, um, what immediately happens is there's a huge period of chaos in these networks. Like people don't really know what's going on. And uh, most of the people actually go into hiding. And then oddly enough, like after a year or so, um, the, the, the person got killed, the functional role is replaced by somebody, not within the network, usually outside somewhere. Um, but it does seem to be that these value networks are very important. So the, the motivation for people to find other people in the network is purely based on, I need to get money. I don't have all the skills. I need to get a person that's good enough and has the connections to, for me to either dump a product or get access to a product that I can sell it. And I think in the network formation process, that's probably one of the key primary factors that drives it. And that's, of course, totally different from a, a psychological symptom network. I mean, there's, there's yeah. the relationship between them is less, it's more nuanced. And also, uh, you know, you're also dealing with the embedding of is the symptom something actually caused by the neuroactivity or is it something that it just exists superfluous uh, to it? Yeah. Hey, uh, guys, maybe uh, we leave some room uh, for other yeah. questions, although it's Sorry. a very interesting discussion. Uh, maybe some questions for Marta or uh, Bernadette or both. Someone else? Apparently all questions answered. Or there's a message. I see yeah, Not yet, see Bernadette, so I'll put in the chat. Here. I, I have a little question for Bernadette. Yeah, mm -hmm. please. Uh, so you, you described this active learning cycle in your approach. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, you know, how much, yes. how much benefit brings that? If you would not have that or not as effective, would you still be able to do these kinds of things? Um, definitely not as uh, effective. And um, I mean, in my example, I have hinted at uh, knowing beforehand what uh, interactions we would likely find. But of course, this is uh, very relevant to find out if our method even works. And um, in the end, we want to create a method where we don't need any a priori knowledge and get um, good and uh, solid predictions uh, in this way. Uh, and the uh, most efficient and efficiently and fast as possible. So yeah, I think um, the active learning approach does, uh, or generally the, the learning approach does provide a big uh, advantage. Right, and 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 you said somewhere that you're now looking at uh, looking for experimental validation. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking of? What kind of systems? And 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 do you have this? You know this kind of data um, available or is it being produced at uh, at hims it's, or 
What is it the is plan? being produced uh, not at HIMSS. Uh, that's uh, two PhD students in Germany that mm -hmm. uh, are working with me from from the get go. They are experimentalists, right? And uh, they got the molecules I showed as test molecules. That was the reason why I used a vendor database because they would be able to buy the substances and mm -hmm. test them and. They are at the moment working to generate the experimental data that uh, I can then hopefully uh, correlate to our uh, results. Yeah. So what, what, one final question, if I'm allowed. So um, Peter Koffene is, is a professor by special appointment uh, also at, at our faculty, and mm -hmm. but he's also a professor at UCL, and he, he also computes these uh, binding free energies or these... Uh, uh, these are binding affinities mm -hmm. and he keeps stressing that you know uh, you, you have to do many of these runs run ensembles in, in in order to get a good view of the actual free energies because a one shot simulation may not be good enough and he typically runs i don't know 10 to 50 uh, different runs of the same system in, in order to get you know really a distribution of these free energies so how do you feel about um, that? Is that required in your case? I I didn't go into detail about the method I use. I am doing alchemical transformations where I basically change uh, my system in several steps uh, during the simulation. So I um, turn on interactions between the molecule and the respective environment mm -hmm. um, membrane interface or water and i am doing 80 steps to get the molecule from basically a vacuum state to a fully coupled state with i see all right um, yeah. well let, let, let's not go so, into yeah, technical he, details but I, uh, I, I, I would right be interesting to, to take a look at that like stuff. This. yeah yeah thank you bernadette thank you you're welcome Okay, thanks, uh, Alphonse. I saw a question in the chat for Marta. That's, uh, but Marta, you already answered it, but maybe you can briefly explain for the rest of the audience that's maybe not uh, uh, reading uh, the chat. Maybe repeat the question uh, first. Yeah, so the question was uh, is about the data, right? Uh, which is a very important thing uh, if you're going to do any simulation. And um, yeah, so we have found, uh, luckily, we have found one data set. It's a framing of heart study data set, which has like, it was ongoing for like 70 years. And it's got uh, a social network of, of people, which is really rare already. And then also, uh, yeah, so it has a social network that evolves over time, uh, which is the main thing that we need uh, if we going go, are going to work with this. And this also has data about uh, alcohol use and cigarette use and mental health. So you can do quite a lot of things if you uh, have access to the data. Uh, obtaining the access is quite difficult because it's like a, it also has genetic data and you need to have, you have you've got so many requirements. So that's been quite a long process as well, but we hope uh, to have it quite soon. Um, okay. Thanks, uh, Marta. Any other questions? And maybe I have a question uh, for Casper. Casper, you mentioned you have, uh, well, you don't have access to the PGP uh, phones or messages. I would say you get the, get the social networks from the police, uh, right? That's correct? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but if you would have- is all like privacy sensitive and- Yeah, and I can imagine that. But if you would have that data, how would you infer the network structure from that? Uh, well, I think one one trivial one is that you can consider the, the the devices used as just entities, and then just see like at the frequency of messages between devices as like a weight. Um, like, but um, but what I'm mainly interested in is, is learning if you look at the the criminal dealings, like what types of uh, how do they interact with each other. So the what we got from from in, from conversations with uh, with the police is that um, most of the Criminal aspects are quite um, functional, um, which is pretty interesting because uh, there's like in the Netherlands at least there's like different um, types of criminal networks. So you have the 
the Turkish mafia and the uh, Moroccan families that are really highly interconnected also socially, but also in the, on a business sense. And um, so they, they operate slightly different from, let's say, other small crime um, criminal networks where they're just only, they know each other maybe, but not really intensely. And inter, like the, the, the challenge for us is that the current methods that people are using, I mean, they do interfere with these uh, criminal networks, but they sometimes actually lead to a higher efficiency, which is not what you want. Um, no, yeah, so the, the, the PGP, to answer your question, the PGP data for me is it's mostly for just getting dynamical rules that we could use to simulate on. Okay, thanks, Casper. Uh, Any other questions? No? Okay, then I would say uh, thanks a lot to Marta, uh, Kasper, and Bernadette for uh, for presenting here. And then I would say, oh, it's one minute of, uh, over five, so timing. Uh, I would say uh, grab a beer and uh, or something else and have a nice weekend. And thanks a lot for joining. I hope to see you uh, next week. Thank you.